Now you mentioned uh, a moment ago, mountain sickness. What is the difference between mountain sickness and high altitude cerebral edema? And, and did you start to have um, all of those sort of symptoms relating to the um, cerebral edema? Well, they are all related, you're right. Um, altitude sickness manifests itself, first of all, in the form of a headache. And what's happening is that your brain craves oxygen. And in an, this is a very poor description, but um, basically the, the, the parts of your cells of the outer part of the brain swells up to increase its surface area so it can assimilate more oxygen. And that gives you a headache because you, you've got a swelling in your brain and that you know, feels like a headache. Uh, cerebral edema is the extreme uh, end of that swelling process where the intracranial pressure, you know, the problem is you have a skull, so a certain amount of swelling will actually crush the cortex and you'll die. And along the way, the symptoms are, are progressively like you can find headaches followed by vomiting, followed by um, loss of balance or ataxia or, or complete exhaustion, inability to talk. Um, and, and then death. And the only way to reverse those symptoms is to descend immediately to a lower altitude. And that wasn't an option for us. So it then became, well, we didn't know what was wrong with me. Jack was fine. But um, uh, we made the only other choice that seemed sensible. It was, was, was hightail it to the summit as fast as we could, knowing mm. that once we'd crossed the summit, the west buttress of Denali is just a walk. By, by comparison, you know, it's, it's a serious climb. Lots of people get killed on it, but I mean, it's, 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 it's a snow slope um, that you can walk down pretty much, you know. Um, and we knew that we would encounter lots of other climbers if we could do that, because the West Buttress is the popular way. Um, but I got very ill, and, um, you know, the onset was gradual at first and then relentless. And um, we managed to climb through all of the difficult rock climbing sections. And we were exhausted, so we bivouacked, um, found a place to put the tent up um, above that and took a rest day there as well, hoping that I would acclimatise and, and get better. But, you know, people know a lot more about cerebral edema now than, than they did then, and we did nothing about it. In fact, just once you've got the onset of those symptoms, you will not acclimatise. Hmm. Uh, you know, it's a one-way street. And it's, it's all getting worse. You know, being up there is not helping you um, to get over it. It's making it worse. And um, mm. we managed to get all the way up to about, oh, like I want to say, 18, 7 or 19,000 feet. And we reached the Cassine Ridge, which was the climb that our two friends had been planning to climb. And uh, I collapsed. I uh, couldn't even sit up. Uh, I, was taking a, I was sitting down taking a picture, and I said, Jack, I can't get up. And uh, he tried dragging me. Um, and me crawling, you know, trying to give the first thought was, oh, come on, we can crawl over the summit of Denali hmm. uh, and get onto the easy ground. But I couldn't even do that. So we had to put the tent up and we wound up staying, staying several days in, 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 in that spot. Um, him with the onset of really serious frostbite and me descending into uh, near coma moments. Um, we hadn't eaten. Uh, we'd run out of food a couple of days before or so. Uh, we were not only cold and very ill, but also starving. Hmm. And, and, and were you like coherent at all in this state? I remember bits of it, um, but the answer is no. I don't remember all of it at all. I look at the pictures and I can, I can recognize myself. In them. I was able to write the book only because Jack was one of the, I mean, all Americans seem to like to write journals. I mean, there must be something they're trying to do in school or something. And, um, hmm. They all do it. All of my friends do it. <laughs> and he wrote about what was happening and he was tearing himself in pieces uh, not knowing what to do whether to stay with me and die with me or he tried to drag me over the summit again that didn't work and he, he had the most awful dilemma for him to, to, to stay there and we'll definitely both die or to try and go for the summit on his own and get down the other side and alert anybody uh, you know maybe to be able to organize a rescue. Sounds good when you say it, but the reality of it is that there's no one who's ever going to rescue me. You know, the people who climb Denali have enough trouble getting to the summit, let alone back down the other side you know, to, to hmm. help somebody. Uh, it's just not going to happen. So Anyway, he didn't have to... 
Sorry. Yeah, you know, he 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 carried that around with him for the rest of his life. I discovered you know, that 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 time, um, and um, he was fixing to, to leave. Um, he left me with the stove and you know my personal gear in the tent, and he was going to go for it himself. And just at that moment, he was uh, relieved from that awful decision because um, Bob Candy and Mike Helms turned up. These are the guys that we've met mm. lower down. And they'd been even slower than us. We thought they'd be long gone on the Cassine Ridge because it's not our hardest to climb we'd done. But they, they turned up and found Jack. And uh, we all sat down together. They had some tea. And I remember somebody giving me some tea and this conversation that went on about me. And the decision was taken that Jack would go with Mike over the summit because Mike had been over the summit before and knew the way. And that Bob possibly the bravest decision I've ever seen, volunteered to stay with me. Um, now bear in mind that Bob was severely worried about his own well-being and survival long before he met us. You know, he had had a reasonably tough time on the casino and they were looking forward to, to, to getting out from under the, the, the risk themselves. And Bob, to do that, you know, to, to stay behind to save the life of a stranger was the most extraordinary human act. <laughs> And, and you, I think you mentioned in, in the chat I listened to that he gave a note, was it to Jack, to give to his family? Yeah, he, he wrote a note to his parents, um, just in case, uh, explaining what he was doing. And um, Jack also had a note in his, in his diary, in his, his journal, that I must have dictated to him because we found it uh, years later. And it was a list of my girlfriend, my parents, my best friends, and, uh, and their phone numbers. Hmm. Just in case, you know, I was never heard of again. So, oh, it's as close as you can come, I think, to, to, to dying and then not. So. Sure. So, so you, I mean, you can't even imagine the, the feelings that, that obviously Bob was going through, uh, Jack. I mean, everyone is there for you and you are sort of incapacitated to do anything about it, which is also really tough on you because you, you know, maybe you weren't with it at that point, but it's obviously has its impact on you not being able to help. Um, but they, as you mentioned, had their diaries and I, I guess it can't all be, all be easy to read. How, how was it for you to read their diary entries oh, later on? It wasn't easy at all. <clears throat> I mean, particularly Jack's diaries, you know, he, he was tearing himself to pieces psychologically over what was going on. Um, Bob. When was, I guess, you know, I guess overcoming stuff is part of that journey. And, and when you have overcome, it's not that everything goes smooth in your life. It's, it's the way you overcome things and how you go afterwards is that really matters, I guess. And, and that's, you know, you, you've found that again by overcoming those hurdles, I guess. And I mean, you've just come so far now, which is, which is really cool. So you've got to artificially put them in as well. A lot of the time now, like I think in the past it was there, like you, you got to go hunt or you starve, like mm. come home with food or don't come home. Like, mm. you know, like mm. there were times where, you know, and it's not far back in human history. Like mm. all of our ancestors knew how to slaughter animals and, you know, like up until very, very recently, like, that was that was what you did like even if you were hurting them and stuff like times the times have changed very quickly and i think that change has made it hard to live in the modern time like you have to or you have to invent challenges for yourself yeah. or you're gonna feel like you're not challenged and then and then within that you lose self-belief and you know you lose your your power in the world and your ability to you know ultimately it's you know suicide rates and depression you know depression drug sales and those sorts of things showing that it's it's very hard to live you know for in the in the modern world i believe this is you know at the heart of it and even like you know creating a podcast like i i've been through this challenge i haven't done it as well as you guys that <laughs> like that in itself like you manifest the challenge for yourself that you can go well yeah we you know we're doing this thing like and mm. you, you you solve a lot of different problems around you're planning and scheduling and, and now you've got this, you've invented this thing in your lives that 
is a, you know, it can be a, like, it's a big thing to do. It's a challenging thing to do. It can be, you know, are we going to nail this and all the different self doubt and questions that come with, you know, creating anything. But if you don't do those things, if you don't launch into it, if you just sit back and think, ah, oh, yeah, like probably don't want to listen anyway, I won't do it, you know, or, you know, like who cares if I can lift a bit more weight or who cares if I get my body composition a bit better this year or who cares if I start a business or whatever the thing is, right? If you don't put those artificial things, you know, challenged into your life because they are artificial compared to the primal thing of like, yeah. either kill this bear or this bear kills me. And one yeah. of us is going to feel satisfied at the end of this encounter. <laughs> like those, those situations very rarely arise now. So uh, yeah, like I'm, I'm a huge believer in, in that sort of process of mm. whatever it is that you can, you've kind of feel an itch of like, I probably should start a podcast, like talking to some cool people or, you know, whatever it is that excites you guys about it, you know, why, why you did it, you know, it's even the connection that you have to each other and that sort of thing. Like yeah. there's so many benefits that come out of it when you take action. Mm. Um, but it's, it's so easy just to sort of sit back and think, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it, do it one day. Like, uh, not sure when that day will be, but, uh, you know, I'll do it one day. And that's, I think that's, yeah, that's a big part of what my life is about now is about helping people just to, just do it. Like take, take that next step, that thing that you, you think you'd like to do, like start that now. Like don't, don't worry about getting it all organized. People think they're going to do good things on their own because they see that. And that's kind of how things are portrayed, but mm. it's, it's never on the, it's, people who do great things. It's never on their own. Like one way or another, it's, it's about serving. It's about the people who help along the way. Um, totally. And, and to, just before we get on to real uh, movements, a um, couple of things that you said there, which, you know, lots of stuff I've kind of read about and thought about a lot lately and also just reading some of your posts on Insta, just talking about like family and, you know, family now is like, it's kind of very singular and isolated. It's just you and your family looking after your own kids. And, um, you know, that's actually um, also a recent thing, you know, like we, yeah. we used to be in tribes and we all used to sort of look after each other's kids and, and it's also weird, like, or it, it seems weird because when I speak to some of my friends that are from like Eastern Europe or uh, India and stuff, their parent, they still live with their parents and stuff. And you're like, mm. that's weird. Why do you do that? But actually, this is how we have always lived. Do you know what I mean? It's so looked down on now, right? Like, it's embarrassing to say you live with your parents. Like, even once mm. you're, as soon as you finish school or finish uni, it's like, if you live with your parents, you're a loser. Like, that's, how it's portrayed in movies and sitcoms and whatever. And our culture is like, you've got to get out of the house. But yeah, I think the modern family, it's, it's a difficult, difficult uh, construct, like not having cousins and, you know, aunts and uncles and grandparents around to help look after the kids um, and to support the relationship. Like, I think it's very difficult for a man and wife you know, to, to stay together. And, you know, if you look at like sex at dawn and those sorts of things, like mm. a lot of people are questioning monogamous, monogamous relationships and those sorts of things. But when you put that in the context of sole responsibility over, you know, multiple other beings and, and not being close to family, like it's, it's no wonder I, both parents working, all these sorts of things. Like I, I don't, I can't understand even how any families stay together. You know, and most mm. of them don't like the divorce rates are so high Ridiculous, and, yeah. and it's just, it's just not right. Cause then the kid ends up with like, well, who's even, you know, who's even connected to me and why do I only see him every now and then? And, and they have even less support because they have one parent and maybe a, you know, surrogate or someone, and, you know, it's, it's, there are families that are super connected and that their cousins and everyone all live close together, but they're, you know, it's less and less often. It's, it's you guys as well, right? Like you South Africans, one's in London, one's on the Gold Coast, yeah. you know, everyone's just moving around the world now. And it's, I guess one of the consequences of, of this global kind of lifestyle. And it's great. Like there's so much good stuff that comes out of travel and I love travel and, but yeah, everyone living all over the place now for work. And it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's a big, big, you know, wicked problem, as they say. Like, you, it's not one that we're going to solve today, Gareth. But there's, there's certainly a lot against the modern family, and I think same sort of thing, process-wise. Like, there has to be a lot of conscious effort to keep a relationship together, um, to keep, yeah, to keep a family together, to to you know, and try to actually have some of that support as well where where we can. Like, my mother-in-law is coming out again um, during January, so I can go 
on the roosters pre-season camp because otherwise I, I wouldn't be able to go um, with the animals and stuff that we have now. But even like leaving my wife with the two kids for a week, like it's just not right. Like mm. it's fine if you, everyone else is around, if the uncles and aunties and cousins yeah. and, you know, grandparents and, you know, it's no big deal to go out on a mission. But uh, waking Chronic fatigue yeah. and anxiety or depression, it's, it's, it's a mental state, it's a mental disease. So it's difficult for someone to understand because they can't see the bruise or the cut. It's happening on the inside. And I think it's good that people talk about it because it doesn't make it so... They don't feel isolated like, geez, I'm the only one feeling this way. Mm, What's yeah. going on? Um, but rest. Listen to what, you know, when it's a bad day, stop. Don't do too much. Uh, don't push yourself. That was a huge thing for me. We just keep on pushing, pushing, achieving. Stop. There's a reason why you're tired. And yeah, between that and meditation and yoga, you know, exercise is important, but it's the type of exercise you do. Because um, even exercise, I realized that it was kind of reciprocating an anxiety attack, that heavy breathing, the tight throat. So I actually didn't want to even do it. I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. So yoga was great for me. Because I could control it and um, calm me down. Uh, and of course, get out into nature. Yeah. Mm. Therapy on another level. Mm-hmm. Therapy on another level. That was also a huge turning point for me. I'd have met a friend. Um, it's crazy. I knew her from like eight years ago. I moved overseas, came back, never saw her again. Obviously, you know, you see each other on social media, but nothing like a conversation. And she went through a massive change. She lost a lot of weight. I mean, she was very overweight when I first met her. She lost a lot of weight. And I just come back to George. I was like in the middle of my anxiety. And I remember she re- she reached out to me. She's like, Joe, I'm going to do this photo shoot to show how much I've lost. And just for myself, if you're confident, I'm like, awesome. She's like, can you please be there? I want to, I need some tips and some help. So I'm like, I was nervous because, you know, when you're in the middle of anxiety, you're scared that will happen at any stage. Mm-hmm. So I, I told her, I said, listen, Donna, I've got, I'm struggling with anxiety. It might be a bad day if you're okay with that. And just saying that out loud kind of gives you a little bit more strength. Wow. There's, mm-hmm. no, there's nothing you're hiding anymore. Person mm-hmm. knows they're okay with it. You know you're okay with it. So it was a great day. It was fun. And she said, oh, Joe, it's, I hike. I go hiking in the mountains. Will you please join me? None of my friends or anyone else hikes anymore. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to try this. Because again, ang- anxious, you know, it's that whole um, recreation of what you feel. The heart rate goes up, the throat swells up, everything. So I'm like, okay, Donna, I'm going to try. And that's how we started. Hmm. We started to walk in the mountains and it was such, such, such a thing mentally and physically processed for me, just being out in nature and being with someone who understands, who's there for you when you need them and not on a, not in a judgmental way or a obsessive way, but just, they're just there in the background. Such a great message that Jody. I think, uh, we, you know, we've often spoken about it is just the fact of saying it out loud to yourself first and foremost is super powerful but then someone else is listening and someone else has the same thing and they go, it just lo- allows them to, uh, first of all, realize that not only other people are going through this, but there might actually be a way to fix it. And it might Ooh. even be quite simple, you know, or something like that. You, you, you sometimes think you're in this world of like, um, there's no way out. And um, you yeah. know, it's, just, uh, it's so cool that you, uh, and obviously nature on the back of that is a, you know, we were also speaking about this a lot lately, Gareth and I, is, is slowing things down in your life. And you were mentioning it earlier in your, your thoughts. But I think nature has a way of just automatically doing that when you immerse yourself in nature and keep quiet for a bit. So, um, yeah, I think those are really great uh, tips, you know. I mean, just, I don't know, I always tell a client, just go and sit outside of the garden mm. and watch a bird. They're not thinking about tomorrow, what they still have to go mm. and see or and catch, or they didn't think about what they didn't catch yesterday. They're in the present in the moment. And sometimes they'll sit there and look at the bird bar for 10 minutes. The bird itself, it's just there. It's just in that moment. Mm. And then it'll fly off and come back. And I'm like, that is a perfect reflection of how the human brain should work. 
I mean, yeah. they are an animal thrives. There's no fear. There's no anxiety. There's no um, questioning. It is what it is now in this moment. And it's being itself to its fullest potential. Hmm. And to be able to watch that and experience it, you start to, you know, I think us as humans will never get to that point. But just to watch and experience, you start to be able to take in the, um, the message that nature is trying to give us. And that is to be able to just be fully present and not worry and have this immense fear about the past or the, pre or the future. Just be present and yeah, slow it down. We live way too fast. We need too fast. <laughs> yeah, that's very powerful. I think a lot of people, and it's probably because of marketing and stuff too, they think that they, they have to do certain things to be healthy, you know, and actually it's very simple to be healthy and it doesn't have to cost you anything like whatsoever drink more water sleep more go outside eat seasonal boom there's a few that, that could be nothing like you know what i mean and and that's probably i don't know that's probably the 90 percent of what you need to do and it's um it really is that easy but but unfortunately there's this whole other game going on in the world and that's like you know the corporate game making cash blah, blah blah which which of course has its place but like you know it kind of overtakes oh, yes. the, the other bits and you and, and and you have to be conscious uh continuously conscious of the two because mm. you can't live mm. without the one and the other i mean it's it, you do you have to make money it is a fast-paced world but you have to be aware that if you live in that environment it's going to catch up to you some more of the time and you need a plan on how to counteract it to be able to balance your life out but yeah, like I was saying, it's so simple to be healthy. The whole excuse about, oh, it's so expensive, I can't do this. No, uh, it's one of the most affordable ways of living. Mm. And unfortunately, most people are addicted to um, processed, expensive food. It's an addiction, it's nothing else. Mm -hmm. And you have to kind of pull them out of that addiction and go through with goals, get rid of all of it, and then start again. And it's not an easy process. It's hard. Change is hard. Um, no one likes to change. We like to be in comfort in our little, <laughs> our little zones. So when you have to change everything up and it, it becomes uncomfortable, no one likes it. For sure. And talking about change, you actually went through a big change yourself, I guess, in terms of who you were and who the Jody Carlett's brand was. You know, so you went from like a bikini bodybuilding girl to more like a yogi. I guess, in a way, type of um, type of um, girl or brand. Um, what was that, uh, you know, transformation like for you, and, and how difficult was it to, I guess, reinvent yourself? Um, I always back when it was the bikini brand, you know, the whole fitness, strong, sexy kind of look. As much as I love it, I still struggled to connect with it. I never quite fit it in. Um, you know, even when, when, when these different supplement companies would do promotions and stuff, I was never the face for it. I mean, I did not look the part. And even though I promoted that lifestyle, I struggled with it because I didn't feel like I put it in. It wasn't me. So it did gently transition and I slowly moved over and was more plant-based and I did more functional training and blah, blah, blah. But it was only when I actually got anxiety that I actually it forced me to relook at who I was and just be honest about it. This is me. I like it. Own it. Um, and yeah, and once you did that, it slowly transitions into who I am today. And yeah, you lose a lot of friends and you lose a lot of clients or whatever the case. But that's okay. You gain a lot more. You actually get to where you need to be. And I enjoyed the transition. It made sense because I was going to something I wanted to. It wasn't going away from something I still thought I had to. Um, it was nice letting go. Mm. It's actually quite a nice feeling of letting go. It's okay. You can let that it go. It's not you anymore. It doesn't define you anymore. Because, um, you know, being a pro and being part of a federation and living up to certain standards, for me, that was the de definition of who Jody was. And I thought if I didn't have that, who am I? And it kind of scared me. But at the same time, I knew it wasn't me. So I had to let it go. And when you do, it's like, oh, relief. I'll be myself. Mm. <laughs> um, and I mean, I know I'm going to do some more transitions and changes. And that's how yeah. you grow as individuals and humans. 
but um, I think if you allow it to let it, to let it flow and don't try and hold onto it and restrict it, then it will just be a good process and enjoyable mm. process. And like So were you aware that like this was maybe a little bit different and that there were people that lived in other places? Or, uh, like not part of, of a cult, you know what I mean? Yeah, but they, my mind had been taught a certain way of thinking by the leaders in the church doctrines and the ideologies of the society I grew up in. Uh, so I had this perception that there was this like world outside Florida. We called it the world and it was evil and full of sin and adultery and fornication and murder. And um, the people out there were lost and going to hell. And that glory of our was the sanctuary. So I believed in my heart that I was living in the safest place in the world, the one true church of God. And that's, I couldn't even think or want to be anywhere else. Like, so I had this perception that the outside world was this horrible, evil place and that I was living in paradise. Um, yeah. That's does crazy. that answer your question? Yeah, it does. So, so were they, were they like teaching you this in the church? They're like, this is the place to be. And you know, outside is evil and it's like hell or what, what, what sort of indoctrination did they sort of give you and, and tell you about, you know, the outside world? Yeah, so I, as an adult now in reflection, I tell people that I was brainwashed and indoctrinated. And in a way, we all are brainwashed and indoctrinated by the media we consume, the books we read, the people who influence us. But in Gloria Vale, there's a very, there's a very focused, intentional way of teaching the children to bring them up in a certain way that they almost couldn't believe anything else um, or creatively think for themselves. You're not taught to think for yourself. You're taught to believe what the church tells you to believe. And you're taught that for you to think differently or question it means that you haven't got your heart right with God, hmm. which could result if God decided that he was going to come back and you being damned to an eternal life in hell a lake of fire and brimstone being tortured forever and ever. So there's this deep sense of fear created in children. And in me, I had a very deep sense of fear that if I was doing something wrong, it was going to be this terrible, terrible consequence. Mm. So it stops you from thinking for yourself or openly rebelling, or even if you see things that are wrong, you think, well, actually it's me that's mm. wrong. I shouldn't be thinking this because this is a rebellious thought. Jeez. So um, they use guilt to control what you think and how you perceive the world around you and interact with it and behave. Wow. It's really powerful that though, isn't it? Because, you know, God is always watching you kind of thing. So, you know, you can, even when you're alone in your own head, you are still being watched. I mean, how crazy is that? Yeah. Yeah, so you self-monitor, right? Yeah. So a lot of the time, the leaders don't have to do a lot of the, say, the work in terms of controlling their followers because they the followers do it themselves because they so have they there's such an ingrained belief that if they don't, they'll go to hell. And then, yeah, and that if they do what they are supposed to do and follow all of the rules and live, you know, as a perfect Christian and they will go to heaven, that's the reward system, yes. then, like, it's almost like there's not a choice. Yeah. Like, what would like what would you do in that situation? Yeah. I would probably always choose heaven, if that's sure. what I believed. Crikey, of course. Yeah. But, but, sorry, buddy. Go no, you got man. No, man. No, I was just going to, like, ask, what, what sort of roles did people have within the community i know we spoke about your your mom now but what other you know what did like a a normal uh, person have to do you know you mentioned there were the servants and the shepherds but you know what, what did everyone you know have to do uh well 
the men did the work on the farms and the businesses, etc. The women did the work at home with the children, the sewing, the food. Um, so they're very, <clears throat> there were very polarized gender roles within Gloria Vale, which strangely enough functions really well because everything is taken care of. Everyone knows their place, knows their roles and works together to achieve the, the result, which is a successful family life where everything is taken care of. Um, but in terms of like roles, if we delve more into like the family environment, um, I was taught that there was God who was the head of us all and then the leaders who communicated directly with God and then the the husbands and the men who were submitted to the leaders then wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as mm. unto the Lord. Um, and then children obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. So that was the role of the family. And I would, I would say that the husbands or the men, they're not really like husbands or what I would expect a husband to be now. They're more like breeders. Like they go, out and they work and then they come home and they make babies mm -hmm. and they Gloria Val didn't practice any birth control which is why I grew up in a massive family like 13 it was normal for, for uh, children in a family my mum grew up in a family of 16 siblings so she had, um so we we were taught and I was taught from a young age that birth control was murder and mm -hmm. Um, that we were to have all of the children God gave us. So me, the men and women were really, they were like, they're breeders. They're mm. there to make children, to care for them, to raise them up. And and that's where they, how they valued themselves too. So for women, their value came in the form of how many children can I have? Mm. How submissive can I be to my husband? Wow. How good of a wife am I to him? And to men, their value came in, um, am I working hard for my community? Am I contributing? Um, you know, is the work of my hands providing not just for my family, but for all the families in my community? Hmm. Really interesting. And yeah. it all seems to work. I know it's, it's not right or anything, but for some reason, uh, if everyone's been given a role and you stick to your role, whatever that role might be, you find purpose. And I suppose that works on some level, you know? Um, yeah whether that's it's really, yeah yeah it's difficult because what is white right and what is wrong like mm -hmm. the more you travel and the more you see the world there almost is no right and wrong there's just different and um the way that we live in western society is different to how an, another culture lives um and we've all got our problems we all struggle with drugs and crime and mm -hmm. uh, so it's very difficult for me to like stand back and judge Glory Val because there's so many things in Glory Val that I'm like, well, they've got it made in comparison to Western society. Like they don't have a drug problem in Glory Val because they have no access to drugs. Mm. And statistically speaking, the marriages in Glory Vale are more successful than in the Western world. People stay together for life. Yes, there are some separations because someone chooses to leave the church. But statistically speaking, the marriages are more successful. Um, there is, I believe, statistically, there's less depression and anxiety in Gloria Vale. Um, because a lot of the things that often bring us stress in our lives are taken care of. Like, you don't have to worry about money. For a woman growing up in Gloria Vale, she wouldn't even ever think about money unless she was in a leadership role. All she would care about is doing her bit for the community, raising up her children, caring for the other children, supporting the other mothers. Um, yeah, so. Wait. 
So, so, but just before we, we finish off, you've obviously had tons of business experience, life experience too. There's a couple of things that kind of resonate and stand out for me. You know, I'm sure there's, there's, there's millions of others as well. Um, but you talk about the importance of showing up and not living with regret. Uh, what, what advice do you give to, to people in life and in business? And I just, I mean, I was lucky enough to experience a person who was very close to me's life regret when I was young enough for it to sink in. And, uh, you know, it's a, a story that I was quite lucky that went quite viral uh, when, I, when I told it. But it was a, a great aunt who had fallen in love when she was in her 20s and she'd met a person and then for circumstantial reasons ended up never seeing him again and splitting up. And just before I take her, took her to the home a few days before she died, she was crying and she was telling me, you know, I wonder what my life would have been like if I'd married Leslie John Moore. And I thought, sure, what a horrific thing. Like, I just never want to be sitting there uh, with my grandchild regretting stuff I didn't do. And even when I look back, like I've made terrible mistakes. So, like my life has certainly not been perfect, but I've tried stuff like and I, I, I've, I've given it a good shot. And at least the one thing that currently, I mean, there's certainly, I, I don't want you to think, you know, people have this kind of weird view. You ask people, you know, if you could redo your life, would you do anything differently? And only an arsehole would say, no. Like, are you mad? I would start investing 20% of my paycheck from, you know, the day I started working. I would definitely <laughs> do that differently. If you didn't start investing when you're 18 and you have a chance to go back and not do that, you're, you're an idiot twice. Right. Like, like, there's, there's no doubt in my mind. I would have started investing earlier. Uh, but, you know, and I certainly do regret that I didn't do that, but it's fixable. You know, I can focus on getting that done now. I don't want anything meaningful. I don't want to regret not trying things. I'd far rather try something and fail it than uh, not try it. Because I talk about this idea that everything you say no to in your life, uh, at that point you say no to it, you're writing a check payable later in your life to regret. And I, I think we have to be better curators of our future self. I mentioned this earlier, but every decision you make, when you go to bed at night, I mean, you rip off your shoes. Right? You just take off your, your, I came back from gym yesterday and I ripped off my sneakers. And then I quickly bent down and I untied the laces because future version of me, the woke up this morning, it has to, tie the, has to untie those laces. And I would rather give future me a better chance. And uh, I want to make sure, and, and it's future me that has to deal with the regrets of decisions that I didn't make and the decisions I make today. And I think you need to always sit there. Like, I want to keep a diary. I was hoping to actually start doing it this year. Uh, but every morning when I wake up and think, like, what am I committing to do today for future me? And um, what did past me, how did past me drop me in the shit today? You know, past me had that pizza for dinner. Like, and I know past me enjoyed it, but now present me has to work out twice as hard and has mm. to, you know, really not eat, uh, you know, eat very, very well today because past me was greedy. And there, there are these three versions of you, this past you, present you, and future you. And you're, you need to be better, you know, you need to be a better relay team uh, for mm. yourself. And regret is a big part of that. And unfortunately, future future me is a person who has to cash all of those checks payable to regret. And I want to make sure that they have a, as close to a zero sum game to, um, to pay off later. You know, that South African philosopher. And I, I struggle to agree with him, but he, he's an, I don't know if the term is anti-natalist. Have you heard of the movement? I think so. Yeah, um, he was on another podcast. On another we listened. Podcast. Yeah, yeah, David, yeah. someone or other. Yes, he was with Jordan Peterson on the uh, Renegade Report. Did you yeah. to that? No, it didn't. Not but that, we have no. heard him on another podcast, and he was quite. Right, so he basically believes that um, we would have been better off. The worst thing your parents ever did was had you. You'd be mm. better off because life is suffering, and uh, I think the first thing we have to he didn't prove well to me was that suffering is bad, because we, it seems like we pursue suffering. You know, people train for months and suffer uh, for you know, an Ironman and then they do the race and they have that moment of euphoria. Like we seem to be suffering machines, like we, we seem to like it. But I do struggle with this idea, the idea that the end of your life is hard and often filled with regrets and difficulty. And often when people look back at their life, the whole thing didn't feel worth it. And I wanna kind of do better. I wanna, I wanna do my best to try and prove that guy wrong. I wanna, no matter how much suffering there is there in my life, if I, you know, I have a painful death and things happen, I want to make sure that I do a good enough job to say, ha, you know, in my case, buddy, you were wrong. 
like I, like I, I feel like I owe it to myself to, to do the best I possibly can to say to him, I'm glad my parents had me. And it seems mm-hmm. like such a, when you first hear him, you feel like, oh, this guy's a bit of a crackpot. And then you sit and you think about it a lot, yeah. which I have done. And I think, oh, there's a lot to be said for what he's saying. There is a, like, even in a good life, there's a lot of suffering. You know, you, sp- you spoke, uh, Craig, I think it was you earlier when you were talking about the privilege and the different lives we have. But life is shit for everybody. Like, and that's his whole hypothesis is that, you know, no matter whether you're born in a, in a small little shanty town in Africa, it's all, you're always measured against your surroundings. Yeah. And, uh, and his hypothesis is that life for humans is, is difficult and hard and you would have been better off not having it. And um, it becomes actually difficult to prove him wrong. Uh, the average human life probably, you know, wouldn't be that great. Uh, uh, and you've got to work hard to prove a guy like that wrong. And I think I want to make sure I do. I love that. I think also, you know, knowing that it's going to be tough and it is going to be hard and you wake up kind of knowing that, then it's fine. You're like, cool, uh, little challenges. Because every time you overcome a small challenge, you feel good. And so... Uh, if you've got lots of little challenges, you feel good actually a lot because you overcome them. And I guess there's some kind of weird thing that, like you say, we actually as human beings kind of, uh, we just kind of gravitate towards uh, struggle sometimes. But maybe that's what it's all about sometimes. And maybe it's not a bad thing. You know, at the end of the day, you 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 become a uh, this improved human being maybe on some level by going through tough times. And, and maybe that's the value of the life, you know. So, yeah, but it is, a, it is an interesting theory. I think that's what we are, right? I think we are problem-solving machines. That's why I don't worry about AI taking over. People are like, you know, what if AIs come and take over and they lose all of our jobs? We all lose our jobs. Well, so what? Right? It's not like we're here to work, right? Work is what we do in order to do other stuff. But what will happen is we'll do what we've done consistently throughout his- history is we'll just solve something new. And there's always something, like, that's what we do. Like, we, we, we chase conflict. We chase struggle and we try to actively solve stuff. Like we, we, as a, the one thing that the species has never been as satisfied. And um, that's, that's an interesting proposition. And it, it does speak to this idea that we're, we're, we're struggling. We're constantly in some, we're struggling with something and we're constantly trying to fix stuff and get better. And I think that's why I get excited about, you know, I love the idea. I think capitalism ultimately will be one of the shortest, it'll be a very important period of human history, but it'll be a very, very short lived one. You know, the true capitalism as we know it will exist for maybe, let's say we've got another 50 years running that way before we have to have some sort of universal basic income or something will make, uh, will kill capitalism as we know it. So you'll have this kind of two, 300 year period in, of history that will mm-hmm. just have been this significant in the, the switches it flicked and how it changed us. But I'm far more excited about what we start solving when, when we take that up, when we no longer have to worry about living, about paying the bills. And, you know, staying alive. What kind of crazy rad shit are we going to solve then? <laughs> mm-hmm. And, that, and, that, and there'll, there'll still be suffering. There'll still be all of those things. Everything will be consistent. But then we'll be solving really meaty, meaningful problems. And I'm so excited. And, you know, I, I would love to live to see some of that happen. Other lessons. I mean, you, you basically, one of the things that you've taken and change in your life, you, you sort of listen to your heart more um, these days. Were the other sort of key things that you took from that experience that you sort of take with you uh, these days? Yeah, but I mean, look, I think it's so important that when you, when you put your focus and your energy, but it's got to be aligned with your medium and long-term vision, right? And don't create, don't create the vision based on what you think other people want your vision to be. And that was always my problem for a long, long time, Craig. I'm known in my group as the people pleaser. I'm the yes man, right? Mm-hmm. I'm the guy that will make everybody happy, will you know, move around, come to an event, even when it doesn't suit me, just because I want other people to be happy, right? <clears throat> so I guess the big, the, that, that big lesson for me is what, is what is my vision, what is right for me? And to be able to say no, but it's okay. It's oh, okay. Yes. So I'm going to be that offended if you say no to them. And, and that is still, you know, in the developmental stage for me because, you know, for so long, I was always the one saying yes. So, yeah, that, that was a valuable lesson for me, you know, and does it suit me? And, and sometimes that, you know, people are like, oh, but that's selfish. But I think in life, you have to be selfish, bud. 
Because if you're not selfish and you're not happy, then how can you be in the right space to then, you know, make someone else feel good? So, um, yeah. yeah, that's my thing. But I think it's all about now being the best version of me, making me happy so that you know, the energy I portray and can give is one based out of love because I'm loving me and I'm loving myself and I'm loving my space. Therefore, it's easy to share that love with you rather than having this inner turmoil on the inside and pretending to love you or, or be interested or do something for you. 100%. No. Yeah, that's so important, but I think, I think people get confused when, people, when other people say, oh, you've got to love yourself first and, and all these sort of things, but, but you actually really do because like you said, if you don't love yourself, how are you honestly opening up yourself to others and, and giving them your true self and, and loving them like uh, as much as you possibly can when you're just like not happy inside. Um, it's such an important thing. Just take care of yourself first, seriously. And then, and then you're ready for everybody else. Yeah, for sure. Otherwise it's just a facade, Gareth. And I've lived many facades, brother, many, you know, I'm, I'm very good at putting on a character for people, right? Mm -hmm. but, you know, when, when during that stage, especially, but I just had zero interest in the conversations I was having. That's why I wasn't retaining anything because I was had mm. this battle of the mind in my own head. So I was there physically, but not spiritually. And for me, I really want to be, I want to be there spiritually, but in connect properly with people. So the big thing for me last year actually was trying to take a break from putting energy into, into, into relationships, right? So it was all about being present and doing what's right for me and taking each experience with every group that I was in without you know, getting excited about a girl and then developing, trying to develop a relationship and then getting distracted and then doing it again. It was like, right, Ryan, no serious girlfriends, no like too much time and attention on one specific person. It's about you. Be in the moment, be present, be a good person. And that really helped me a lot, but in that full year of cycle, I suddenly came into this year being like, I think I'm now like, I'm ready. I'm ready, I'm open, and I have a much better understanding and awareness of you know, the decisions that I'm making. And that's been great. Yeah. Craig, you're talking, about, you're talking about lessons. The other lesson I think is this, and I think this is important for a lot of people out there, right? We live in a society where it's almost like chronological. You need to do school at this age, you need to be working on your career, and meet your spouse at this age, you need to be having kids by 30. You need to be living in a great big house and, you know, accumulate all this bullshit. Right? And something that I've realized, and especially during that stage, was it's okay to reset. Mm -hmm. It's okay. But at any age, if you are not happy with your circumstance, and you could be 60 years old, 38 years old, 30 years old, but press the reset button. It's yeah. okay. You want to let go of everything, start a new career, go back to school. Dude. There is nothing stopping you from doing that today so that the rest of your life going forward is really where you want to be, right? And I hit a little bit of a wobbly probably, you know, a couple of months ago, I suddenly like, I'm about to turn 38. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I've had all these amazing experiences, but really, what do I have like to show for it? You know, and I was like, oh my God, and some of my friends, you know, doing so well. And I was like, dude, it's okay. It's okay. Calm the fuck down, right? <laughs> and and I'm playing this game now, which is like I'm 18 again. <laughs> I've been 18 again. 20 years ago, I was 18. I was this young buck going to Stellenbosch University for the first time. Dude, I'm 38 now. I'm a young buck, still full of vibration and energy, but and I can do anything I want for the rest of my life. I love it. And, and, and shit, but that is so liberating. It yeah. doesn't matter, mate. And stop worrying about what other people mm. think of you. Fuck it, but it doesn't matter. It really doesn't yeah. matter. What do you think about <laughs> that's important? So oh, I love it, man. So powerful, you know, it's but it's a whole adventure, but and, and if we could just take more adventure out of every day and say, you know what? Cool. That's where I want to go. Change, pivot, and go for it, bud. Go for it. I love you it. Know what? If it doesn't happen for you in this life, it'll happen in the next life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's time, bud, because our spirits are transport. They will continue, bud. Right? This is not the end. <laughs> Physical body we're in right now, it's an experience, bud. So yeah. talking about some of skills, like the, there's obviously a massive uh, uh, skill set and a lot of science and, and psychology uh, uh, behind sales. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the art and science of sales. Uh, sales? As you said. Yeah. 
Firstly, I love sales. Sales is the most <laughs> amazing thing. <laughs> and I always tell my staff, you know, they're like, oh, you know, I didn't realize I was going to have to sell. And I was like, buddy, you've been selling since you were three years old. <laughs> but when you went to the store and you asked your mother if you could have a sweet and she said no, you were a poor salesman. <laughs> you didn't get what you wanted, right? But slowly you That's figure funny. these out and you realize that your parents have little buttons you can push and ways of saying things to get what you want. What do you think that is, mate? That's an exchange, right? So sales for me is all about exchange and it's an exchange of energy. And this is something that I bring into my training a lot, right? So yes, it's psychology, it's understanding uh, a certain personality trap and, you know, are you analytical? Are you more emotional? Uh, what kind of triggers can I press or identify in you when I'm sitting face to face with you, right? But really it's all about energy because sales is a human to human interaction, right? You've got something that you want. I hope you have that thing that you want and I'm going to exchange that maybe for money or maybe for service or whatever it is, but it's an exchange. And one of the things I try to get my staff to understand is that money is really energy, right? So it has an energy. We think about it. We, you know, we worship it. We exchange it all the time. And all you're doing is you're changing the energy, right? So you want to get money from a guest, but what are you going to give in return? And our therapists and you know, most people out there either have a good service or they have an amazing product to exchange for that money. So yeah, sales is all about that. It's learning how to bring that exchange in a natural way by listening, identifying, really getting inside of your head so I know what it is you want. Because if I'm trying to sell you something that you don't want, it's going to come mm -hmm. across as pushy or you're just going to walk away from the whole situation, right? But if I know what you want and I can figure that out, then hopefully, you know, if we're in the right space, I've got that, I've got that thing that will give you the results that you want. And, uh, and it's exciting, but because it's like a little challenge, right? Every, every human being is like a little puzzle piece. It's like a Rubik's cube. <laughs> You've got to figure out what makes them tick. What are their interests? What do they like? What don't they like? You know, what should I be saying or doing? Or, you know, it goes as far as body language. You know, the NLP, Gareth, that we, yeah. that we speak about is all about body language. But, you know, it's like people like people who like themselves. So <laughs> if, you sit, if you sit opposite me and you've got a big smile on your face and I'm sitting there grumpy pants, Clearly, we're not going to connect, right? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, simply open my eyes a bit, put a big smile on my face, and right away you're thinking, shit, this guy's quite cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so um, true. Yeah. yeah but there's, there's a lot to it. You know, there's a lot of nuances when it comes to sales, and there's a lot of things you've got to think about. And if you do it repeatedly enough times, then you become good at it because you learn how to move naturally and identify things without overthinking it. And you can just dance with them rather than fight them. Look, the, the thing is, my girlfriend back then, she woke me up the next morning. I think I was still a bit tipsy. And I was lying <laughs> in bed, and she normally puts the radio on while she's getting ready for work. And I sort of dozed off, and I could hear the DJ saying, and tomorrow night, the Springbok Nude Girls will be appearing live. <laughs> at the." And I thought, oh, cool. And I quickly woke up and quickly wrote it down. And then that evening I met up with a, with a band and I said, well, I've got a cool name for the band. It must be Springbok Noodles. And then I went to France. I said, but one problem, there's no girls in the band. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, exactly, exactly. That's super awesome. <laughs> you know how many people are going to come watch us? Uh, Nude <laughs> girls? I mean, uh, and it worked like a bomb. It was a charm. It was an instant uh, cultural kind of phenomena, the name. Because obviously it brought back to the older generation the thing of the Springbok hit parade albums. Yeah. Of the, 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 co the cover girls, there was always cover girls sitting on a bonnet of a car, naked, <laughs> semi-naked, stars in the nipples. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and, and then it was just um, also the, the fact, part of our success with the thing that we also actually sounded quite unique. Um, as much as I want to sound like Nick Cave and a lot of people, <laughs> you can't sound like other people. You can only sound like yourself. And then also because Theo was a Pantera, quite more metal guy, and I was a bit more Pixies and yeah. more alternative. Blue Man, Francia sort of shared also more of alternative vibe. And then eventually Adrian, when he joined us, he was into um, acid jazz and more clubby stuff. Yeah. So the conglomeration of all these um, different 
taste in music um, created a very unique sound um, for a grunge band to kind of have trumpet in was quite weird. Um, and, you know, the fact that I, my voice sounded unique and I used a lot of delays and so we created a, a massive sound uh, and our songs were very eclectic and we, we did from reggae, we went from, in some songs we went from reggae to punk to jazz and then back to punk and so I think it was really interesting um, for the people back then and it was just such a vibe. The 90s was, the 90s there was, there was a stage where it was all about experimenting and being different and like I think every generation probably, except now it's not very, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I don't hear a lot of interesting things. It's all kind of the same. But also, I mean, you guys had come out of that real suppressed sort of a state in, as, a, as a nation and then everyone was like, check at me, look at my, cre this is my creativity, yeah, express myself, true. you know. So, yeah, we came out of an area of um, under the pillow, smothered under the pillow, Mm -hmm. And then when we got out, that's probably why we did jazz, reggae, and disco all in one song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Makes total yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah. And just while we're talking about lyrics, um, your song Blue Eyes, which is just an absolutely uh, beautiful song, uh, one of my favorites, it captures a really sort of sad time in South Africa. Maybe, maybe you could sort of explain how you came to those sort yeah. of very deep lyrics. Okay, so basically, um, I wrote the lyrics after I uh, heard a story from a friend of mine who was a, a police psychologist, this lady. Um, at the end of apartheid, um, the cops all went home. Everybody kind of hated them because they were seen as the last protectors of apartheid. Mm. And they would go home and they, you, you've got your, your service pistol with you at home. Um, the whole world hates you. There's not enough money to feed the family. Why, why, why get drunk? And in that period, there was a lot of family murders amongst cops. Mm. So my friend told me about this situation. So, and then she told me about this story where this guy wiped out his whole family, except his little blonde daughter was hiding in a cupboard somewhere. And by the time he wanted to kill her, he came to his senses. He got her out of the cupboard and he drove to the police and he gave himself over. Mm. So, um, so, and that is where the story comes from. We're going to grow you up, sir. Daddy's little blue eyes are come for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. Right. So, and that is what that comes from. But, you know, like songs, everybody, I mean, uh, <clears throat> that is what it's, that's what it, the song is about for me. But every, everybody's got a different yes. interpretation. You know, some people will probably sing it to their little um, child and, you know, yeah. it's a loving thing, which yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. Just, just pull out the family yeah. murder story. Yeah. Wow. It's a beautiful <laughs> song. Yeah, it is beautiful. Yeah, Absolutely yeah. beautiful yes, song. I, I, Absolutely. Actually, I actually got goosebumps when you actually said that now. And uh, I was listening to it uh, before we started the podcast just to kind of get in the mood. I think that's yeah. an so important true. lesson, like, yeah. for anybody do something that you love that makes you happy that you're passionate about and 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 that'll come out in the work you do like you said you know because if you're doing something and it's contrived because you want a certain bunch of people to like you it's just not going to come over as authentic oh. and you're not going to do well look in, in art you you're going to know and i find it in painting and in music you always know it sucks <laughs> if you've got a feeling that uh, I mean, that's about so much, so many times in the in the in the nineties and stuff. We make music videos, and I would go, "Ooh, this is a, I've got a feeling about this. This is not good." And then <laughs> it comes up, and you cringe. It's oh my so god! So terrible. Some of these nineties videos are so so bad. So um, I, from then, I've I've learned to you've got to follow your gut and just make sure if you know something is a bit shaky try and fix it because you're going to live with it for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's really great advice. You also spoke about, you know, just um, amazing journeys that you've had through different places, but also obviously you've played at some amazing festivals, Opie Kopi, obviously uh, I've had a great party there, Glastonbury V festival and a whole bunch of others. 
what was it like playing in front of big crowds like at a festival and, and which one was your sort of favorite um well i shepherd's bush empire we did a couple there it was i think we did We've done many shows at Shepherd's Bush Empire, but I mean, uh, there was one stage where things were really crazy, um, where they almost asked us to uh, stop the show because they were, <laughs> they were scared that the galleries were going to collapse. No way. Because it was just, uh, the people, uh, it was just incredible. You know, the energy of the audience and stuff. Uh, Opi Kopi, there was a couple of shows that was just crazy but i think it had to do with the fact that we won lsd <laughs> <laughs> something to do with it maybe yeah. but i mean you know it went from, we were like the first first one of the first people to play double copy and it went from five thousand people to 15 to twenty five thousand in a couple of years so it was such a vibe you know and yes. But like everything that goes up, it must come down. And uh, today it's not a, as successful as it used to be. Um, but it's, again, it's just because the world has changed and music has changed and the way how we uh, listen to it and what type of music um, is out there. be really tough at times to just go okay cut through it all what is right for me what is right for my child and, and our family and uh wow so that's really great advice i think finding that center and connecting with yourself and your and your child um is actually really good uh thinking i reckon yeah amen i mean that's that's all that matters also in your life that's why i think it's such a good example like this podcast is about different people's stories and how they made decisions. And I think the same guiding principle should apply. Like, it doesn't matter what the best outcome is for other, one, other people or what like success might've been defined like in your parents' time. Like choose what success looks like for you and define it. Maybe it means a graduate degree. Maybe it means a good day watching football with your friends. Like, mm. I don't care, but like know it for yourself because if you don't know it for yourself, you're gonna inadvertently interpret someone else's version of what mm. success looks like and then measure yourself all the time by their standards and never feel like you're always going to feel like you're coming up short. Always. Totally. So it's such a great, uh, it's such a great lesson. And I, uh, you know, unfortunately not everyone takes, takes that sort of advice or thinks of things like that, but it, but it is really important, you know, just like govern yourself by what you, th what is important to you in your life and, and don't compare because everyone's comparing and you're never going to be like, you know, that other person. So um, really cool advice there. So basically, yeah, sorry. Oh no! Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just saying, I'm, I don't get it right. <laughs> I, there's definitely moments where I feel like crap about myself, but we're also human. Like, of course, you have to allow yourself. I don't know. And this is where I think tribes are really important. Like, you need to have people in your life. Like, everyone needs a Gareth and a Craig, you know, to like talk about these things with, who are also on the same page. To be like, oh yeah, that sucks, and like maybe I don't have an answer, but we are gonna sit here in the muck with you and like have an honest conversation about what's going on. And that's yeah. how you get through it. Like you just totally. get better day by day. Exactly. Yeah. Totally, totally. Yeah. We like that. So I know we've touched on it, you know, a couple of times already in our chats and um, maybe there's something more to this. Uh, so you said that part of the reason uh, you left your, your marketing agency job was because your name is Margot and uh, being called Margot has had a big influence on your life. And, you know, you've had, you've made important decisions off the back of that too. So maybe you can go into that a little bit deeper if there's something else to it. Sure. Yeah, no, we, we touched on it, but I'll, I'll go a little deeper that when I, I like looking at life sort of holistically and I'm going to say it differently. It's a, it's such a big topic. I don't want to look back at my life with regret. And there are a lot of people that I meet in the day to day who, in my view, are living quiet lives of just desperation. And that to me is always my biggest fear because of Margot. Um, I think so many people have circumstances in their life that they can't control or are born into something really terrible. And that's what my family had, right? Like they were born into something that they couldn't control and they didn't have any options. So when I look at people who have options, and they aren't maximizing them or they're not feeling good in a life full of options, it 
makes me profoundly sad. Um, and I know that we often feel like we don't have options. Like we feel like victims and we feel like we don't have choices. And when I think about Margot, I remind myself that I absolutely do have a choice. I have a choice in how I respond. I have a choice in my attitude. I have a choice in, um, I am lucky enough to have a choice in so much more because I wasn't born in 1940s, you know, uh, Europe. And I like am a Jew in a time where that's not a big deal. Um, and there are so many, there are so many things that I consider a privileged life that I have options. And so I just don't want to waste that. And defining what it means to waste that is up to me, right? There's a lot of ways that if I, that I can like judge myself poorly, mm. if I say like, I'm going to waste it because I'm going to push myself to have a life that isn't mine. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about really evaluating my choices in my life and thinking, okay, there were so many people in my family who didn't get to live their lives. Like their lives were cut short unfairly. So I have an obligation and a duty to live a good life, period. I feel entitled to a good life. And I, I, I often laugh when people are like, millennial generation, you're so entitled. Yeah, yeah, I think we are because we are the first generation in the history of the world to have options. Mm -hmm. So I don't see why it's a bad thing to feel like you're entitled to not hate your life when that is an actual <laughs> outcome you can have for the first time in human <laughs> freaking history. Like, it blows my mind that this is a bad thing. Like, I, I, I just don't believe in the, the vestige of suffering. Like, I don't think that we need needless suffering. We live in a time where, you know, like, remember 250 years ago, the richest person in the world was shitting in a bucket in their room, in a chamber pot. Like, they still didn't have a toilet, right? We have a time where this is no big deal. Like, even if you are the least wealthy person in America, you still have to have a cell phone if you want to get a job. I mean, we live in really an insane time, if you think about it. And um, so to me, that's always such a privilege. <laughs> and it's so beautiful. And that's something that shouldn't intimidate us. Like, I want to lean into that and say, okay, how do I craft a life that's in alignment with what I believe a good life looks like? Does that mean family? Does that mean impact? Does that mean friends? That, does that mean a suburban life? Does that mean, like, whatever it means. Like, at least having, like, I would feel like I didn't do justice to Margot if I wasn't having this conversation with myself every single day, and if I wasn't raising my kid in that way. Um, mm. And that's, that's really what lit the fire under my ass for so much of this. <laughs> so, so, so from writing and, and doing it for such a long time, what, what is your advice to like write good and what are, uh, to write well? <laughs> <I> say? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and then also like what are good writing habits? Yes. So <laughs> there's no other skill in the world that you can acquire passively. Like you cannot, you can't watch the Olympics on ice skating and like get better at ice skating. But if you read a lot, you actually will get better at writing. Um, and so this is one thing that I always tell people who want to improve their writing is this read people whose writing you respect um, and that you enjoy. And those might not be the same category. So like make sure you read both. Um, because I think a failure a lot of us make is we'll read what we think is important or what our friends have told us to read or what might hit the list. And I actually think that that's a huge mistake, um, in part because there's so much crap that's published that's just not good. Um, and there's so many classics that no one has, pays attention to that are so, so powerful that can influence your reading. And um, sorry, influence your writing. And one of the ways you discover your voice and get good at refining your voice is by copying other people's voices. So I remember I went through, like I read all of Ogilvy's books and for a long time, my writing sounded like him. And it took me a while before I got him out of my head. And then I moved on to Claude Hopkins phase. And I would, like, you, you go through each writer and you start mimicking them until you've integrated so many of them that it becomes mm -hmm. yours. And so it, it took me years to get to that point. But I would say if somebody, um, wants to get good at writing, number one, read people that you respect and that you enjoy. Um, and then number two, ass in the chair. Get your ass in the chair and write. I think that prolificness is a really big part of this. Uh, and the hardest part people have is, is sitting down and writing really, really badly. Um, and like knowing sort of the process of writing, which is, I don't care how talented you are. I don't care if you were told all throughout your childhood years, you're talented and you're great and you're really good at writing. That's actually going to hurt you down the line because you're going to think your writing is supposed to be good because everyone told you it was good. Um, it's kind of like what you were saying earlier, Craig, about like ignorance is bliss sometimes. <laughs> um, 
it, the, the goal I have for people is like always start knowing that the first thing you put down is crappy. Just like expect it to be crappy and get the crap out of the way. Just be like, I'm just going to write a whole crappy page and maybe there'll be one salvageable thing from it. And when you take like expectations off and you start the writing practice, you actually start to get better because this is where it actually gets good. There is no one who sits down and does a first version that's perfect. Mm. We were presented with a very false model. Like I remember reading, you know, published works of, you know, it would be like Hemingway's diary or something. And there's something called a movable feast, which was like his diary from when he lived in France. And I remember thinking, oh God, this is just how this man thought. Like someone saw my diary from this part of my life. They'd be like, wow, she's an idiot. Um, And (laughs) the crazy thing is like, those things are edited. They're all edited, right? Like nobody's first version makes any sense. We're all really self-conscious and we all use too many adverbs and we say like and um, <laughs> whatever the written version of that is. And we're super <laughs> verbose and we'll say things in 20 lines that could only be one line, but like there's no way to get to that without getting to the shitty, going through the shitty first draft first. Yeah. Wait. So Gavin, coming back to you, um, you were just the little kid at the back of the class doodling away uh, and uh, take us back to those times as a kid where those seeds of your creativity were being sowed. Uh, Yeah, so that's right. I was kind of um, that kid in class who always was doodling instead of uh, listening to the teacher. And um, yeah, my files and books would just be littered with, with doodles and eventually you know, other, other students would ask me to, to draw in their files and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, just, I've always had that, that passion for drawing, I guess. And, you know, kind of crossed over with my passion for, you know, cartoons when I was a kid, for comic books. And yeah, I've just always loved to doodle. And it's just kind of thankfully been able to slowly but surely, you know, keep going throughout my life where I'm able to, to do it for a living now. I just wonder, were you like... Were you like a natural sort of out the blocks, you know, and just really good at drawing or is it something that you learned? <laughs> uh, it's a good question. You know, can you really learn to, to draw? But, you, you know, as, long, as far as back as I can remember, I've always just yeah, been doodling or drawing, you know. So I'm sure that I, I sucked when I was a kid or I, I'm very sure that I sucked when I was a kid. And just, you know, it's just like anything, you know, you know, the more you do it, the more repetition you know, slowly you get better and better. And, you know, yeah, I can see, I've seen some of my old drawings when I was a kid and, you know, I thought they were cool when I did them, but when you look at them now, they're just like, <laughs> like horrible. So yeah, there's been, you know, definitely a gradual learning curve. Um, there might be some innate talent, but it's definitely only part of the, um, the mix. I think it's definitely mostly practice. Yeah. Of course. It's like, it's like with anything, isn't it? You just, yeah, it's just, you know, I just do. always, I always, lent towards drawing more than sports or writing or music. Um, I've got a musical family and I never, you know, picked up the guitar or anything. It's always just been drawing. So <laughs> that's cool. Guess there's always going to be challenges, whether it's a nasty boss or yeah, exactly. laws, you know, they, <laughs> one way or another, you have to work around stuff. So, yeah. um, you know, you spoke about uh, Zen pencils uh, briefly a moment ago that you, you know, you're, putting in really good quotes from, from inspiring people um, together. Maybe you could just expand, expand on that. I know you also do other stuff, you, which involves a lot of storytelling. Um, what is the storytelling process and, and can you sort of grow that and improve on that over time? And, and have you found that you've been getting better at it? Yeah, I'm um, cool. That's a good one. Um, yeah, so I've kind of found that, yeah, over the, over the years since I started the website, um, a lot of the early posts were just kind of posters like one single image, uh, one nice looking image. And over the years, I've kind of found that I prefer telling stories through the comics. Um, so I think it's something I've gotten better at, definitely. Um, so yeah, once I kind of find a quote that I'm gonna work on, I just kind of, um, just kind of have it sitting on my desk. Um, I just kind of keep reading it and, you know, I'm kind of working on it, you know, the previous comic while I've got that on the desk, the, the one I'm going to work on next, so just to have it um, in my head. And, you know, sometimes I know what the idea is straight away. Sometimes I don't. If I don't, then, you know, I find going for a walk, I have 
I've got two dogs, so I take them for walks every day. I find that's a great time to to get um, the imagination um, running. Um, and yeah, just kind of sometimes it's just it's boring. It's just sitting with a a notepad and <laughs> looking at it, um, hoping that an idea will come. Um, but um, again, I find the more that you do that process, the more easier it becomes. Like the idea will come. You don't have to get too um, anxious that there's no idea that eventually an idea will come. And that's when I just start to flesh it out. I just start to do a lot of sketches. Um, my, I might just focus on one scene first and get that done. And then I build in the rest of the story to fit that scene. Sometimes I come up with an ending first and work backwards. Um, so yeah, there's all these little tricks, I guess, that you can use. And yeah, I think it's definitely something that you can um, get better at. And yeah, that's kind of the hard part, just writing the story, thinking of that idea. And once that story is done, the actual making of the comic isn't like super hard. It's just kind of more of a craft. It's just building, you know, drawing and inking and coloring. That's just kind of more of an, um, like an automatic craft, I guess. It's the, the initial writing and idea stage, which is definitely the hardest. Hmm. Com I, I see like comics as a, I guess, a form of art and, and a great way to express yourself. They're definitely not just for kids, that's for sure. Um, right. Can you maybe tell us why you think they're a great medium for, you know, trying to get a message across or yeah. provoking some sort of thoughts? Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, that they are a great medium, one that's maybe not, um, you know, utilized as much as it could be. But, you know, obviously, you know, they say a picture tells a thousand words. So it's a visual um, media. Um, so the visual, I think, is more important than the, the words. I get well, I mean, I shouldn't say that. They both are equally important. And, you know, you know, if you just have a prose novel, it's one thing. If you just have, you know, pictures, it's another thing. But it's just a weird kind of alchemy of putting those two together. You have pictures and words working um, and, uh, together to tell a story. I think it's just um, really powerful. And also it's good because, you know, instead of like saying if you had to, if you're a filmmaker where you would need, you know, a whole team of people to be working on this film, um, a whole army of visual effects people, whatever. Um, with a comic, you can just have one person and he can kind of get across that same message as a film, although it's kind of you know, a different medium. But, you know, I could just be one person and, and put together this elaborate sci-fi fantasy or, you know, drama or comedy. And I can kind of tell that visually and with the, the writing. Um, so, yeah, I think that helps. And another thing is that if you can't even... A lot of uh, people use Zen pencils to learn another language, like uh, non-English speakers use it to learn English because, you know, you can kind of tell what's happening with just the pictures. You don't really... And you can kind of put the words, you know, you can kind of guess what the words are going to be if you kind of have a half understanding of English. So, yeah, it's just a, a visual language that is powerful, I guess. But yeah. um, talking about, you know, when you, you know, reading cartoons as a youngster, you obviously for a long time actually wanted to be a cartoonist. And uh, how did your parents sort of take to that? Uh, not great. <laughs> um, so, you know, I haven't, you know, uh, Asian parents and they kind of steer kids towards the more, um, you know, re reputable careers like a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, something along, along those lines. And, um, you know, like any Asian uh, parents, they want you to be a doctor. That's the dream. That's number one. <laughs> um, number two is probably a lawyer. Um, and but since I showed some kind of artistic talent, uh, they kind of wanted me to be an architect. <laughs> because you know they figure you know you know you're drawing you know why don't you like being an architect <laughs> isn't that just drawing and I you know I was not interested in that because I don't really like math so um you know they weren't that encouraging about it mm -hmm. uh, to be honest and you know they were never really believed that it could be a, a career I never really believed it could be a viable career to be honest especially you know living in Perth Australia you know there's not really much of a a cartooning industry here, <laughs> you know, or the, or the, my heroes were either from America or the UK. Um, 
so yeah, it was definitely unrealistic uh, growing up. Um, but you know, after high school, I kind of I knew that you know I wanted to do something maybe creative, so I kind of went. I studied graphic design um, at uni, and uh, that was you know it was okay. I, I didn't love it, but it wasn't the worst thing in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, kind of. So yeah, my parents, you know, they were just they wanted me just to be get a job, basically a good mm-hmm. job, and not have to worry about me, which is fine. I understand that now, being a, a dad myself. So. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it was normal. It's fine that they, you know, they didn't encourage me, but they just wanted the best for my future. Yeah. Um, so I kind of listened. I was a kind of a good son. I did what I was told. I went to university. I got a decent job. And Anyone that knows a bit about investment banking, working as the head of risk is like a ridiculous role. You know, it's... Um, there's a, there's a, so much responsibility on you. So, you know, really well done, but how did you find it? Um, you know, as a woman working in a male dominated industry, like how did you manage it? Was there, did you have any difficult moments at all? What was it like for you? Yeah, it was, it, it, I found it extremely <laughs> challenging actually. And especially because I look a lot younger than my age. So I'm 42 now. And so back then, I was late twenties, early thirties. So, um, looked even younger. And so it, and it was, I, you know, looking back now, it's totally my own perception as well. I would always come into a boardroom with the perception that they're going to think that I look really young and that I'm 12 mm. and that I've got nothing to say. So I always felt like I had to prove myself in the first few sentences. Um, of meeting someone before they would take me seriously. Um, and then, you know, put sort of different Asian cultures on top of that, where it's very, you know, like Korea, for example, is very much, it's your age, like it's, yeah, it's male dominated, but it's also your age and the time that you've spent in the workplace as to, to the hierarchy. Mm. Um, and the seniority. So yeah, it was, it was super challenging and it was just a matter of just like, basically getting in there and believing in myself the whole time and and probably with a um with a lot more sort of like domination type energy mm. than than really felt comfortable and that you know wasn't really me but I felt like I had to dominate in a lot of those situations um and I guess that that's probably I think has led me on the path of um I guess losing myself a little bit in, in, in those roles and those images and what I thought I needed to be um, in terms of being professional and serious and um, you know, all those sorts of things. So yeah, it was challenging, but again, like I also had, like I said before, incredible people supporting me and I had some, there were some men that were very challenging and dominating back and, you know, some experiences that I had, but there were also some men that were absolutely phenomenal and they were by my side and supporting me every step of the way. And they had my back in those negotiations and those meetings and, um, and yeah, so I sort of experienced both. Yeah. Wow. That's good probably like, wow, this Aussie lady is hardcore. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's but, funny. Like in my later years, I, like I, I, I've sort of also have a very soft side to my personality and some of my later friends are like, we can't imagine you being like, <laughs> being like that. I'm like, yeah, there's a tiger in there. Don't worry. Yeah, about definitely. That. <laughs> <laughs> and so the last year has been, really tough like 2018 was a you know tremendously traumatic uh, tragic difficult one for you for various reasons i mean we'll just touch on on the first one uh you've spoken a lot about your dad and uh, sadly you lost your dad and um you know even through all the i guess the the hard times and that he was still such a big part of your life and someone you really admired and look up to uh, how has that impacted you and maybe made you reflect on your life yeah um it's been huge um it's been like a whole variety of emotions as you can imagine after him suffering for so long um a big part of me is 
hard as it is to say, it was relief that he was finally at peace and not suffering. Um, and, and actually I can feel a connection with him. Um, so much stronger than I have for many, many years now that he's gone, actually, like he, I can feel his energy. I can feel him supporting me. I can feel like all those things around yearning to be able to communicate with him. I can now do that. Like, it's really weird. I can't explain it, but it's like he, he's there and he's communicating with me all the time. Whereas in his physical body, he couldn't do that. Um, and yeah, like all that striving and achieving and doing things for external reasons is falling away a lot more quickly now that he's gone. I really sort of feel him and I, all these memories are flooding back of when he was well, when he was younger, just like this spunky, hilarious um, joke star, like just rebel, like just didn't give a fuck about rules and like just would do whatever he wanted he didn't care what other people thought just all of that is just flooding back into my body just going and him his message just going just be whoever you you know be you be the real you and and shine and don't care what other people think and um yeah so that that's been really beautiful and um i I'm so grateful that uh, having Kate and the challenges that I just spoke about becoming a mom and really getting present to the impact that I have on my kids and other people in the world, whilst that was really super confronting the last few years, I've, I've put a lot of effort into healing my relationship with my dad. I mentioned to you before that I was holding a lot of judgment and re resentment. And so the last few years I've had a lot, a lot of one way conversations because he couldn't talk, but really just expressing myself with him and making peace and, and having lots of forgiveness. Um, and I'm so grateful that I was able to do that um, before he passed away, mm. you know, because I think a lot of people hold on to, to this illusion of what they think and stories that they, and I know it feels so real. It feels so real. Um, but it's just a story and a perception like the truth of, of a connection between a parent and a child, no matter what's happened mm. is just like, it's just this love that you can't describe, you know? And I was depriving myself of that feeling. I was depriving myself of that for, for so many years when it was there all along. Mm. And yeah, so it, it's been, um, a pretty significant event in in my life <laughs> obviously mm -hmm. yeah it's really beautiful uh yeah. coxie there just to imagine that you you know had just flooded with those good thoughts and feelings as well that's just really great to hear you know i think yeah it's very easy i suppose if it's such a long slow drawn out thing to just um see him your dad in that way but you know when he when he's actually gone you you flooded with those good memories again so that's mm. yeah amazing actually but you know look, and, uh, oh, sorry okay, sorry i just thought of something uh, mm. um like even like the last couple of weeks before he passed away i was there with him a lot and i remember one day i was there um you know just sort of he was laying down i was holding him and i was expressing like just how much i appreciate how hard he worked for us all of his life and um, you know, how much he loved us and, and, and just sort of like speaking words of love to him. And um, my perception was like, he, he took a couple of swings at me and he couldn't talk. And he was like, really, he kind of got that frustrated look on, on his face. And I was like, whoa. And I got so hurt by it. And I was like, fire out dad. Like I said, I don't know why you did that. I'm sure you're in a lot of pain, but I love you anyway. And you know, it doesn't change the way I feel. I'm not sure why you're angry. And over the next, you know, 24 to 48 hours, I drove myself insane trying to, trying to work out what he was trying to communicate to me. You know, why is he angry with me? And all of that crap that, that you, you know, spin yeah. in your head. And then um, the day that he passed away, the morning that he passed away, I was sitting there with him and I was just, I was playing his favorite songs and I was just in this real connected space with him. And 
I was basically praying for him to get the most magical angel wings, like, and have like an extra amount of bliss given to him for all the suffering that he had had in his life. I was just like, you know, please just like make him so free and just so full of bliss when he goes. And as I was sitting there doing that, I was also then, it was a really weird experience, like feeling that, that love that I was giving to him. I was feeling that back to me being given back to me through my heart, like a sort of like a cycle thing. And then I heard his voice just randomly out of the blue and it was his cheeky voice. Like he obviously wasn't talking, but his voice in my ears said, um, what did he say? He was like, I was trying to give you a hug, you dickhead. That's what he said. <laughs> wow. And I was wow. like, what? And I, I had memories flood back of when, how I thought he was trying to take a swing of me at yeah. me. And he's like, yeah, I couldn't get my arms above my head to give you a hug. Oh, I was like, boy. oh, shit. And then I was like, I started feeling guilty. And I was like, oh, my God, like I'd missed this magical opportunity that, that my dad was trying to hug me and all that kind of stuff. And then, and then he just said, and then his voice softened and he's like, it's okay, sweetie. Like, everything is okay. Like, all wow. of it, all of the past, like, everything is forgiven and all that remains now and forever in this moment is that is love and like that exact feeling that that i was experiencing in that moment so yeah and he, he passed away probably about 10 minutes after that so wow yeah sure yeah <laughs> <That's so> sad. <laughs> sad yes mm. <laughs> it's it's so interesting now like to, uh, talking to you and listening to you explain these things i just i'm just going back to my school days when we studied uh like videos and and, and films and i think we did strictly ballroom in my year and and at the time i was like thinking it's so stupid why, why is our teacher teaching us about studying a mo movie they, there's not there's, surely there's not all these things she's talking about to it you know but now like, like you know now obviously um I'm like aware of that. But at the time I was like, more to it. So, yeah, but now there's more to it. Of course. Yeah. So much more to it. Just listening to you. Look, I mean, I, I, I can only imagine what your strictly boring uh, <laughs> lesson must have been <laughs> like. I, I, I remember those same lessons and they are stupid. They're stupid at this level. People, you can take a movie and, and, and put any meaning you want on it. You can say, Oh, you know what they really meant to that scene is this kind of weird kind of interpretation, shall we say. And that stuff I resist because I think what you really got to ask, the only real question to ask is what, did the, what, is, what does the filmmaker mean? What, what was the filmmaker trying to communicate to you through the scene? And great filmmakers try and communicate a lot of different things to you, not just the content of the scene. There's subtext, there's symbolism, there's you know, every little thing you do in a movie, from how you light it to whether it's a, it's a close-up, whether we're this close or this close or this close or this close, all has a different emotional sensibility that it's, it's going to affect you in different ways and, be, and i can tell you being a filmmaker every single angle every moment every every word um, every image is carefully selected and they're, and they're carefully selected in a certain order to have an emotional effect on you and it goes deep you're asking it at, at, at lots of different levels and great filmmakers succeed on all those different levels so you can get into deeply analyzing a film which becomes very psychological um, and there's a reason why films are the greatest art form of the 20th century, though that may have been superseded now by social media. Um, it's because they talk deeply to the psychology of what it is to be alive at a, at a, at a human level, at a ridiculously human level, <laughs> at a cultural level. Um, and, and then, of course, there's just the story, you know, a fun story and you eat your popcorn and go, hey, I forgot about that. Well, you know, the moment you get to the cinema. But actually, when you get into an analytical mode, even if you're looking at just an action, blah, blah, you know, popcorn movie um there is a lot of sophistication that goes into it, way more than you would ever imagine yeah it's interesting like i was listening to this guy speak the other day about um the psychology as you were mentioning and and humans right human nature and the psychology the deeper animal brain within us all w yeah. when you for example on tv have like an, a close-up or extreme close-up of someone's face and their eyes 
that is something that you very rarely see in normal day-to-day yeah. interaction. You can see that person's pupils and that, you know, like, yeah. and it's quite, it's like super moving. That's why, that's why you can be, be transported into another world when you, yeah, when you're yeah, watching yeah. a movie, which is quite amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, look, not only do you never see that in real life, you then take that and then you, you enlarge it to a huge yeah. screen. <laughs> eyes, but my, like each eye is like three, four meters yeah. high. You know? <laughs> so, so that is an unbelievable effect. I, you know, when movies first yeah. came out, that was very upsetting to people to suddenly be sort of thrown in their faces, literally, um, these worlds. You know, we have one lens through which we see the world and it's quite a, it's quite a wide cinema screen scopic lens if you just look forward you can just see that this is and this and, you, and this is the only lens you'll ever see the world in yeah. so you were recently uh the director of a, a sort of a big hollywood action movie oh. called hunter killer which starred gerard butler and gary oldman as you mentioned earlier um, but leading up to the film the um the u.s navy took you and gerard sort of underway for three days on a nuclear sub- submarine as far as i understand yes. um what was that like mad <laughs> Man, I mean, nobody runs something more efficiently than the American military. So, it was such an interesting thing for me to, to experience the American military firsthand. So, I arrive in Pearl Harbor, which is the most secure military base in the world. Um, if you think about it, there, there are 12, I think there are 18 nuclear reactors in Pearl Harbor at any one time. Because all the submarines are nuclear reactors and all the aircraft carriers are nuclear reactors. At wow. any one time, there's 18 of them parked, and the rest of them are at sea. So it's it's the most nuclear uh, active place in the world, um, and the most secure in the world. Uh, and I, I was going to go on what, on the most classified machine in the whole of the American Army, Navy, mm-hmm. the submarines, the most classified, because they are the one war machine you can deploy without the enemy knowing you've deployed it. Hmm. Um, because it's underwater, you can't see it, can't be detected. And so they go to great lengths to, to keep everything on the submarine secret, how it works, what it looks like, everything about it is, is, is classified information. And so to get onto a submarine is no small thing as a movie maker, as, a, as someone who's, I want to show it to the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of reverse thing. But the American Navy have a problem and the, and the one problem is they cannot get people to sign up for the for the submarine call because it's the least glamorous and most secretive so yeah. you go about it oh. you're not out on an aircraft carrier with, with the horizon in this little <laughs> claustrophobic coffin <laughs> bomb <laughs> um, so they have that problem and also this sort of transparency you know it's like People, this, the world is showing each other more of themselves and, and, and they're kind of open to that and they can see how it works well with their allies and even with their enemies to just show them a bit about what they're doing. So they have these two agendas and, and, and they see they, they, have, they also have a, a military wing whose job it is to put their machines into movies for these two reasons. <laughs> so the Navy wanted to make a movie about the latest Virginia class nuclear submarines, a brand new three story high, 150 meter long submarine wow. it doesn't have a periscope there are no periscopes the old periscope you remember from the movie that doesn't have it's all electronic um it's still a nuclear reactor so which is still very sensitive um and they wanted to put that in the movie and, and demonstrate it to the world and to get people to want to be crew for those machines wow. and so they invited us to Pearl harbor to to give us the experience um the script had been written i, I came on board after the script had been done the script had been written with the navy uh, uh together with the navy um and so they were very behind and they were backing it. And they wanted to be authentic and real as possible. And in order to do that, they put us on the submarine. And they took us underway for three days. Um, and they actually ran the drills of the script. So each thing that happened in the script, they would run it on, as though it was happening on the actual submarine. So they did all the submarine drills. And you can actually shoot torpedoes, but not real torpedoes. They shoot water slugs. So they fill the torpedo tube with water. No ways. And shoot that water slug. And it shoots and sounds. And I actually was wow. exactly like a real torpedo. Um, and they ran the drills underwater for us, which was amazing. Wow. Um, and then we got to meet the crew and hang out to them. There's no cell phone signal down there, so there's no cell phones, no laptops. There's no communication with the outside world. They purposely are uncommunicable with, so there's no, you can't talk back to Washington when you're in a submarine, you're alone in this thing. 
Wow. Um, and it's only when they surface, and they don't surface, because this actually they can be seen by enemies. So, they sound. so a submarine captain to this day is the only autonomous war captain in the world. So submarine captains are operating autonomously. They do not communicate. They, they get a mission, they go out, and they do. Um, so it's a very unique world to live in, and a very dangerous world. Because again, there are no portals, obviously, so it's all done with sonar, and they all listen. And anything like an underwater cliff can just come out of nowhere. And you've got to, you've got, the sonar guy's got to see it, know what it is through just through listen. And there's no active sonar either. They're not pinging. They're not going ping and returning the ping yeah. because that game gives away your position. So they just listen to the noises in, in the water. Just from the noises, they're able to work out the whole topography. And then they can not only navigate, they can chase others. Wow. Um, so it's just an incredible piece of kit. Uh, so that was just amazing to go down and be in this very, and when you're in there, it's incredible because it's, it's not made for it to be beautiful. It's not made to be a Maserati, you know, it's an industrial <laughs> machine. You know? every, people need a screen. They're just like, we need a screen here. So screw, stick a screen. Oh, we need a box here. Screw, stick a box here. So it's just boxes and screens, just like the art and girders and bars. And it's just not, it's not beautiful, but it is beautiful in its own way. Um, and so just, just seeing all of this, and I knew that I had to, it was so complex, I knew I could never build a set that was even remotely as decent as a real submarine. So I, 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 we had to build some sets, obviously, film in a real sub. Um, but I, I, felt I had one day filming in the real submarine, and I had to intercut that with my set, so I had to look exactly like a real submarine. So that was oh, the goal, wow. to build the set so that I could intercut them with real sub. Huh. What one a challenge. was born of that three-day trip. It's amazing. Wow. Chief is so interesting, isn't it? It's just once you go into all these other worlds. Um, yeah. you know, just talking about you being really human and the human side of yourself, um, you speak about feeling powerless uh, a number of times in your life. Uh, and one of them was an incident in the cadet force where um, oh, yeah. two guys in your year were beaten up um, and that created a sort of a sense of suspicion um, in yourself uh, around sort of rules and the system, didn't it? Well, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's, you guys have, I mean, you, <laughs> clearly you've been listening to every podcast I've ever spoken on because you've got some great stuff that I don't normally talk about. But yeah, in, in high school, um, I, I just watched a couple of guys who are friends of mine be beaten up. Not, not kind of really badly, but enough by the, the cadet force and, have, and, and having that endorsed by, or not dealt with by the teacher who was leading the, the cadet force, which is really the shameful thing I thought. And I'm not sure if I can put my, my I'm not sure that, that that made me become an anarchist who's like down with all rules and down with uh, whatever, but, um, it does for me raise issues about speaking truth to power, uh, understanding when you have power, understanding the responsibility that comes with power. And just also for me connecting to a value I've got somewhere around that, which is around fairness and the importance of what it means to treat people fairly. And that was a deep example of a lack of fairness and, um, and abuse of power. And that abuse of power is, is particularly what I find disheartening. Yeah. And, and so just like off the back of, I guess, that incident and maybe some others too, you want to help people become more rebellious against the system, but in a good way. Like, what, what do you actually mean by that? Yeah. I, I would frame it um, as less about rebelling against the system but more about not giving up your own humanity to the system. You know, uh, one of the thinkers and writers that I admire is a guy called Peter Block. Um, he, he, his most, his best selling book is called the um, uh, flawless consulting, but um, his more philosophical books, uh, things like the answer to how is yes. And he says just broadly, he says, look, my job or one way of framing the work that he does is to give people responsibility for their own freedom. And he would say that in most power structures and in particular organizations, which is where he did a lot of work and I do my work, there's just an inherent bias to dehumanize people 
or make them, I mean, it sounds a bit more dramatic perhaps than, than it actually is, but certainly a way of saying you can give up your sense of autonomy. You can, you know, it's pretty easy to have a parent child relationship with the organization with whom you work rather than an adult to adult relationship. And you kind of just go, the best thing for me to do is just head down and just play the system. And for me, it's, um, you know, I, I mean, I run a small company, so I don't really want everybody who works at Box of Crayons to rebel against me and overthrow <laughs> me. That's, that would be a, sl a confusing <laughs> outcome. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I do, I do want them to take responsibility for their lives and how they show up at work and for the choices they make. And what that means is being willing to stand up against the tide if, if need be michael i was a, i was an investment banker for almost 20 years and now i actually work as an executive coach myself but um looking back i'm like oh my word things i, I was like i was like a manager and i was like oh my god i was such a useless manager right. um if only i knew how to coach people it would have been a complete different outcome for all the people that worked underneath me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, it's such an important part of it. it it's just not done in the business yeah. world. It's not, it's not the only way to lead, but it's a really powerful and effective and significantly underutilized way to lead. And so we're trying to shift the balance of that just a little bit. Mm, for sure. So Michael, in your opinion, you, you kind of touched on it there, Gareth already, but why is it important to have a coach and, maybe who should have a coach? Yeah, so it's worth distinguishing between coaching and helping managers and leaders be more coach-like. So for us, our focus is, and I'll, I'll answer your question, but just to say our focus is that we think everybody can be a bit more coach-like in the way they show up to the world. And by more coach-like, we mean this. Can you stay curious a little bit longer can you rush to action and advice giving a little bit more slowly? Mm. And that shift of behavior is something that doesn't matter if you're a big boss leader, mid middle of the pack, an individual contributor, a brand new employee, showing up in this world, being a bit curious a little bit longer and rushing to action and advice giving a little bit more slowly is a good skill to have. Also, mm. if you're a human being, a parent, you know, <laughs> A parent or a child or you just interact with other human beings in your day that's a good thing to have yeah. so that that's our focus the question about so who should have a coach well you know in a perfect world i think you have people in your lives who are supportive in that i'm curious sort of way rather than i'm telling you what to do sort of way there's mm -hmm. a there's a place for advice don't get me wrong but it tends to be an overused muscle rather than an underused muscle. And then I think uh, if, you're, if you're lucky enough to have the resources and you have a specific need, excuse me, uh, a coach can be a really powerful part of your success team. Let's put it like that. It's a bit kind of new aging. Mm. But you know, for me, I've had a coach for most of the last 20 years, one way or another in part because I've had things that I want to achieve and I just know that it's helpful to have somebody on my side who pushes me when I need to be pushed and encourages me when I need to be encouraged and helps me face into the hard things I'm trying to avoid and gives me the courage to take on some of the stuff that I probably wouldn't otherwise. And sometimes that's been a formal relationship. So I've paid somebody for a you know, bi-weekly chat. Um, mm -hmm you know, similar to what Gareth does. Um, but I also have, for instance, a mastermind group. So we've met for the last probably 10 or 12 years hmm. and we effectively informally coach and support each other. So your, your coach is about somebody who plays a role of championing curiosity, championing you and showing up with that fierce love to say, look, I'm on your side and I want to push you and encourage you to be the best version of yourself. And sometimes that's a paid position and sometimes it's not. Mm. So, so Michael, what, yeah. what sort of like coach does a person like you get? Is it a business coach? Is it a personal development coach? What sort of coach yeah. when you do pay for it? Yeah. So, you know, with my mastermind trust and actually when I finish this podcast with you guys, I, I have a, my 
by uh, by monthly. Oh no, so twice a month, bi weekly conversation with with them. You know, um, they're more. They started off around business issues because we we're all kind of similarly placed in the business that we were running twelve years ago. But really, over time, it's become much more about leadership in terms of how are you showing up in your life, how you how you being the person you want to be. Mm. And uh, the business stuff is secondary to that. Um, my actual business coach, who I've had for 13 years now, hmm. Ernest, he, he's much more of a kind of sounding board, uh, helping me figure out hard decisions for Box of Crayons, you know, money decisions, people decisions, strategy decisions. Um, so he, he helps me with everything from the big, the big picture vision that I'm trying to hold so sometimes it's like, how do I have this negotiation conversation with this person? Yeah. And mum being, a, she studied naturopathic medicine. Is that right? And so I guess that pl plays into some of the stuff that comes back later in the story, but did she uh, sort of, you know, talk about that stuff as young, you know, when you're younger and, you know, to teach you about food and things? Yeah, she was always giving us like fish oils around exam time for our brain. Um, she was always like, she'd cut pieces of our hair and send them off to see if we were vitamin deficient. <laughs> uh, she was really, like, she's really spiritual and really into nutrition. So anything that could help us, she would be doing. So making us fish and vegetables and we'd be like, oh, we want pizza. Um, she'd be like, no, this is good for this and this. So she hadn't studied in it yet, but she was always fascinated uh, about what we put in our body and how it has an effect and you know, she always said to me you know if you eat this egg in the morning then you'll win your cross-country race and I was like okay and I remember <laughs> thinking I'm gonna win because I got this that's egg. so cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. Uh, positive uh, reinforcement there sure. <laughs> yeah I met, I met I met your mom at the uh we did our final um what did, I guess when you call it like uh, cook or what did we do we we you know we cook for like 20 yes. people or something didn't we and your mom was there and uh, she's such a lovely lady. I can, you know, I can just see where you get all your, you know, your kind heartedness and your big smile and stuff from. <laughs> yeah, she is. She's lovely. Yeah, for sure. So Camille, you mentioned a little moment ago about, you know, some a group of uh, girls being a little bit tough and that kind of thing. But, um, I, you know, when you, were, you mentioned that when you were around 13 or so, you remember sort of hiding your eczema from your classmates and, um, your hands were often like really sore and they were even just like typing were it's like painful from the eczema. Yeah. Uh, you'd even wear gloves, which would give you some comfort, but, uh, and also more than that, it would sort of prevent people seeing your hands. Um, what was uh, sort of the reaction at school and, and how did, how did the other kids uh, treat you at school? Um, yeah, so I did cover up my hands with the ex because of the eczema and it was especially either in computer class because your hands are on show like other classes it would be fine but I think it's because computer class your hand like everyone's hands are out um so I was like oh my goodness I don't want people to see my hands and then it was as well in netball I wanted to wear gloves because it hurt and I didn't want people to see my hands as well um but both times I wasn't allowed to wear them so I'd get shouted at, take them off, and I'll never forget the time that I took them off. And the guy sat next to me, which was one of my friends, he was like, oh, my gosh, what's happened to your hands? Like, and he thought I was self-harming and because there was just scratches everywhere. And I was like, no, 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 like, I'm fine. And he was like, no, you're not, no, you're not, no, you're not. And I was like, I am, I just have this thing. And he was like, what thing? And I was like, I don't know. I just scratch when I sleep. <laughs> and he was like, that doesn't make sense. And I was like, I know it doesn't make sense to me either. And it just like, it really upset me because I just felt like I can't even explain. Like, I felt like I was crazy. You know, I had this thing, but nobody else understood. And I didn't understand, but it was making me scratch every night. Yeah. Well, I must say you're, you're an extremely uh, strong lady, that's for sure. And like, overcoming all of that, is, you know, is, is extremely tough, especially when you're so young. Um, but, but also talking about schools and stuff. And um, I know that you, you had like a couple of fresh starts. Um, like you mentioned earlier, you went to different schools and you had a, a fresh start uh, by going to a new private school. 
yeah. um, which I guess must have been good. But then also other things that sort of started happening is like, you know, you became more aware of uh, what was good for you in terms of your eczema and stuff. I know that you, you mentioned uh, you had an allergy test um, at one point and then as part of like that when you went to the new school you kind of change your diet as a result as well is that the kind of right sequence of how it happened or yes so this was the boarding school that I went to which I was like so happy about new start everyone was so nice and it was like three quarter boys to girls so I felt like there just couldn't be any bitchiness because it was like quite a laddish kind of mentality um and yeah so when I went there I was like okay in the evenings, people are going to see me because I'm it's boarding school. I'm staying over. So whereas at my old schools, I'd go home and I'd have my eczema cream and my bandages. I was like, oh no, I can't have that at this school. Like I have to have clear skin. Like I don't want anyone to see the person that I used to hide. Mm. So that's when I was, you know, I was older. I was a bit wiser, and I said to my mom, I need to find out something why this is happening to me. Like this isn't just something that I'm going to live with. It's happening to me. So she was like, okay, we'll get the allergy test done. And that's when I found out I was gluten intolerant, um, dairy intolerant. And then a list of other foods came up like tomatoes, lettuce, like things you wouldn't even think. Mm. So I was like, okay, brilliant. So glad that I know that I'm going to avoid everything on that list and I'm going to be glowing. Uh, and I'm quite a determined person. So when, someone, <laughs> when I want to do something, I will do it. So I gave that list to the... Um, the kitchen people at school and said I can't eat any of those I think they just put it to the side they were like this girl's on one um and yeah I just made sure I didn't touch any of that food so if it was served to us I would ignore it and my meals would probably be in the morning I'd have a banana because it would either be continental or like full English so I was like oh I don't know what what's in there so I'd just have a banana and then for lunch, I would have um, like a jacket potato with something or like chicken and veg. And then for dinner, always the dinners, I was like, they just, well, because we had foreigners, we'd always do different types of cultured food. Mm. So I was just like, I'll avoid dinner and I'll just have peas. Like literally hmm. every dinner, I just have a bowl of peas because I was like, there's more nutrition in this bowl of peas than whatever's in there. Um, so I did this for like, a good like two years of being at school and mm. my skin was glowing I was still able to like drink alcohol even though I was underage but yeah <laughs> we did drink alcohol um <laughs> and yeah my skin was glowing but I was wow. really really happy at that school I had an amazing group of friends I was netball captain I was doing well in my like subjects at school and everyone was really really kind and friendly and I just mm was so I think yeah I was just so happy there so this, there wasn't much stress <laughs> just uh, just a, glowing, yeah. yeah 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 just a side a uh, side question uh, do you still like peas <laughs> yeah I do <laughs> I do like peas but not a bowl like <laughs> I look back I'm like what I remember people going what are you eating and I'd be like po don't question me. You're having pizza. Yeah. I'm having pizza. <laughs> Would you put some gravy on there at least? Come on. No. <laughs> oh, wow. Absolutely crazy. Yeah. Wow. You know, I don't regret the experience that I've gone through though, because like, like I said back then, like, why me? I'm a good person. I've not done anything wrong. Like I tried to question my whole character. I was like, okay, like you wanted to be a model. Maybe you were struggling with vanity and you need to realize that beauty is skin deep for me. Like I questioned everything about myself and was like, no, I'm a good person. Like, seriously, why are you doing this? And like, now I look back and I'm like, okay, Camille, you were given that challenge because you were strong enough to deal with it. And there's so many other people in the world suffering that by you going through that, you were able to learn the tools that are going to benefit someone's life now. And I like to believe that I had to go through that. That has given me a purpose and wisdom that is going to help millions of people that are suffering in silence. Mm. Um, and it's, yeah. So like when I hit rock bottom and went into hospital and my face went double the size, I'd not seen my friends in ages, I isolated myself. Mm. I remember thinking back then, I don't want to exist anymore. Like I've hit, like rock bottom too many times look at me I can't even look at myself 
I don't want to exist. Like, I don't want to exist. And that I, yeah, it was just like a black hole. Couldn't see anything else. Um, mm. And then went into hospital. They said, you know, there's nothing we can do. I was showing them pictures of me with glowing skin. I was like, that's me. <laughs> this isn't me. Help me. <laughs> Yeah. Help me get back to me, you know, because I think people, they see you sometimes and they think that's how you are. And here's like a pill or right. a tablet. And I was like, no, this isn't me. I'm in so much pain. Da, 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 da. And they said, we're really sorry, Camille. You're an adult now. You've not grown out of the condition. And the best we can do is give you steroids and antidepressants to cope with it. Wow. And I just remember like, it was like, I couldn't hear any noise around me anymore. I just looked at the hospital and it was like, I'd just been given like a death sentence. I was just like, I, and I was alone there. I was with someone that I was working for because everyone else was out. And I just remember thinking like, like I had no words. I was done. I was completely and utterly done. Wow. And, and but you, you've got a really cool story. I think it was your first trip to New Zealand. You and you and Paula went. I don't know how long you'd been dating, but you went there and uh, you did some research about what was uh, going on there with gold. And that's where your life kind of, you know, obviously is now and things kicked off, hey? Mm, yep, it is. Um, and I, I, I think we talked about this uh, years ago. Gareth was just kind of, I was never 100% happy teaching. And I was like, I know there's something else out there. It's just finding it. And so we were, yeah, Paul and I were together a couple of years and we made a trip to New Zealand one Christmas um, for, I think we were there about three or four weeks. Um, and I knew that this area was a huge, um, was huge in like gold back in like the, the 1800s during the gold rush and stuff. And so I, so I had to set in my mind that I was going to, I was going to go gold panning and, and find enough to, to make my wedding ring. And yeah, so I told her dad and he was just kind of like, okay, yeah, we can go. And, uh, we went to a few local spots and didn't find anything. And yeah, went to a few other spots and finally found this little, little Creek, um, where we find a little, had a little bit of luck finding some things. And, uh, yeah, just, uh, we spent probably, Geez, probably a total of maybe yeah, 30, 40 hours <laughs> gold painting, you know, like over, over the course of the three weeks. And um, I, was, I was looking to get about, oh, I can't remember exactly what the number was I needed, but I think it was about 15 to 20 grams for the ring I wanted. Um, and I think I found about one or two, maybe one. Yeah, less than, less than two. So, yeah, <laughs> so I was uh, pretty un unlucky that way. But, um, but I ended up doing, I did have it. Uh, made into my into my wedding ring so that's actually how I got into into jewelry making was uh, I had the jeweler that that was making the ring and just was kind of curious about what he did and and I knew he taught at a university in London uh, jewelry making so I asked him you know what's what went on with the course and stuff and he said oh well you could do the course but you know they might have maybe you know five minutes of one-on-one -on -one time per per course you know session um, because of all the other students he goes or I do kind of tutoring one-on-one -on -one, you know at my kind of studio and stuff um, on Saturdays if you want to do that for a few hours I was like oh yeah that sounds cool so yeah I started catching the train on Saturday mornings down to his place and yeah just learned everything I knew pretty much for um, during the classes I took from him for yeah the next year or so after that hmm, that's wow. so cool man pretty full on and yeah I mean, it must have been, it must have stimulated something in you when you were gold, when you were panning there and it must have still be, even though you didn't get a lot of gold, it must have, even the little twinkles that you did get of gold must have been pretty, must have been like kind of exciting. And there's a kind oh, it of, is. Yeah, yeah. Associated. Like, they, like they say when you, um, oh, you like the gold fever, you know, it's yeah. definitely true. You get a little bit of gold and you just go like, <laughs> oh, it might be worth, you know, a cent. <laughs> <laughs> for the little bit but yeah you're like you see a little sparkle in it yeah it pumps you up and it keeps you going and, and not only that but I hadn't really spent much time with my father-in-law like they had been over to London to visit us um to kind of the summer before for a couple of weeks but yeah so I th it was just good kind of bonding time as well because mm. you know, just kind of him and I out there 
that was cool. cold freezing creeks you know mm-hmm. freezing cold feet and stuff so yeah that was it, that was probably the most important part was just the the bonding rather than cool. actually finding the thirty dollars gold that we <laughs> that we found and being in nature and just yeah exactly oh just stuff, yeah, yeah just beautiful beautiful area and stuff yeah. so alex just moving a little bit on um to sort of one of the more sort of tough times in your life um and actually, it's one of your twins, Grace, was um, diagnosed with a brain tumor in 2017, which is obviously incredibly tragic and, mm-hmm. and just a super horrible thing to have happened to anyone. Yep. Can you maybe just speak a little bit uh, about that, please? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, May 2017, um, just about three days before mother's day. So I can't remember. I think it was the 11th or so I think back now, but um, yeah, we noticed grace was walking like her knee was hyperextended. So kind of, uh, kind of click back when she was walking and then we, we kind of looked at her and I saw, I noticed it the weekend before and I was just kind of like asking, I was like, grace, what, why are you walking like that? You know, like, what are you doing? Just walk normal thinking that she was just kind of goofing around because that's the way she is. And um, yeah, she, and she didn't stop and it kept up like that for a few days. And so we got her into the doctor. The doctor said, uh, oh, it's probably just a, you know, an infection or something. She'll be fine, you know, and, and we left. And that next night, about three in the morning or so, one of Paula's, um, Paula's good friends, uh, called us well, was trolls trying to get a hold of us and um grace had actually came into our room and then paula saw the missed calls i was like oh started getting a bit nervous what was going on and it, her her friend had actually sent the video of grace walking to her sister-in-law so her friends her friend sent it then to her sister-in-law who's a um pediatric neurologist i think it is over in brisbane and she got a hold of Kelly, who's Paula's friend and said, look, I think she should go down to the hospital and, and get it checked out right away. You know, it's not, I don't think it's just an infection like the, yeah. the GP had said. And so, yeah, we went, they, they will, we called uh, my father-in-law in the middle of the night. So three, three thirty in the morning, come over. He came over and picked up Grace and Paula and went down to the meeting, which is where the, the closest, you know, big hospital is about three hours away. And um, yeah, they were there all night into the morning um, got into an MRI kind of four, three, four o'clock the next afternoon. And then Paula called, um, called me and I was back at home, you know, with the kids all day, just waiting. And, um, yeah, called me about seven o'clock that night and said, you know, Grace has a brain tumor. And I remember it was just like an out of body of experience. It was just, yeah. Jesus. I, yeah. I remember, it was in my, I, was in, I remember exactly what happened. I remember what I did. I was in the bedroom and I just kind of was just like shouting, no, you know, or just, you know, just, I think that's just the first thing that came out. And, you know, like Paula was awesome on the phone. Like she wasn't crying or anything um, then. And uh, yeah. And I was just in, in full shock and basically yeah, she put me on the phone with the doctor and yeah, the prognosis wasn't good at all. And mm. yeah, he was like, I think you need to get down here right away. So the next morning, yeah, took the trip down there and, um, and I mentioned like to Gareth that with the whole journey with Grace, there's been so many like signs and this, this day, the drive down there was so like rainy and miserable and come like out of like the mountains and into like the clearing. And so there's nothing on the radio through the mountains and stuff. And we come to the clearing and on like my friend's radio who we're running with, like the sun, the sun comes out. And when the radio starts playing, it's a sublime song on the radio. No way. So was like, yeah. So it was like just a, a crazy, Wow. you know, like when you, when you have stuff that's happened, there's been so many kind of coincidences that they're not actually coincidence, coincidence, yeah. you know, anymore. There's just been so many. Um, so yeah. So anyway, carrying on with that, um, the, the doctor kind of, um, when we met with him, he, he talked to us and he said, look, we don't know. We have to, we'll have to get a biopsy and find out what's going on with it. And, um, but he goes, Oh, but he goes, you know, from the looks of it, it's, you know, pretty symmetrical. Um, you know, it could be, it could be a slow growing thing. And I immediately said, yeah, that's what it is. And he just kind of looked at me like, 
don't get your hopes up, buddy. You know, like mm. to, to, to talk to Paula and my father-in-law later, they were basically, they were basically had no hope for her at all. You know, mm. they were just like, they said the looks of like sympathy from the nurses and the doctors and like the anesthetist was crying and stuff. No so, um, yeah. So I missed all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I, from the, from the get go, I had like a positive mindset that things were going to be okay. And that was no other options, you know? So we flew up to Auckland then a couple of the, uh, the next day, actually, um, she had a biopsy. The surgeon then who was the top, one of the top surgeon, brain surgeons in New Zealand, he had a meeting with us and he said, look, from what I've seen, it looks good. Meaning that is be the, you know, a, a slow growing tumor. And so, um, yeah, they, and it has a cyst attached to it. And the cyst was actually what was pressing on the nerves that were causing her to walk like that. Um, so they drained the cysts while they're in there. And then, um, yeah, we stayed in Ronald McDonald house in, in Auckland for a few days. And then we were back down to, um, back down home and my mom flew in from the States. We had a couple of weeks and they said they were going to call us up and let us know what the results were in, in a couple of weeks. So we said, okay. So we had a couple of weeks go by and they call us and they say, we want you to fly up to Christchurch for this meeting. So we're just like, Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy Cape Fold Mountain.